More than 500 million Yahoo users in 2014 saw their accounts and personal information hijacked by Russian hackers. What protects us against the kind of massive security fraud that affects millions of people? Do we need to resign ourselves to being victims in waiting? Our guests today on Criminal Justice Matters can help us answer those questions. Professor Marie Helen Maris is an associate professor at John Jay and a former Navy specialist in security. She's just published an important book called Cyber Criminology. Professor Maris, welcome. Thank you for having me. Let's start at the beginning. Your book is called Cyber Criminology. Now, when I think of cyber criminology, are we thinking about the science of computer hacking, or are we thinking about the criminals, the cyber hackers themselves? All of it. We're, th we're um, conducting scientific studies on illicit behavior online, but also victim behavior online. And this book examines traditional criminological theories and seeks to determine whether they're applicable to many of the new forms of illicit behavior. Online. Is there is there a criminological theory that applies specifically to cyber criminals? There's no they? one theory that applies to all mm -hmm. forms of cyber criminals, but each theory has something to some information to provide on particular illicit behavior. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff written about hackers, and you know, the the the, the stereotype of a hacker is some kid in a in his private room, in the upstairs of his house, eating Cheetos and just <laughs> going. 24 hours a day, is that, is, that, is that accurate or are they really sort of um, so the war evil games kind of profile. predators we're talking about? Mm. So the war games profile really isn't applicable today. The reality is that there's no single profile of a particular hacker or cyber criminal. I mean, are they business people? Are they criminals in the, in the sense that they're uh, bank thieves or, or uh, computer thieves, or are they just kind of the guys who break into your house? So there are a variety. There are different hackers who break into systems for knowledge's sake. There are some who break into systems because they're a part of subcultures where the ability to break into systems and to do so quickly is something that is considered an asset. Mm -hmm. There are organized cyber criminals that conduct a organized hacks and then obtain illicit information from database and then sell it on the market. And traditional organized crime groups also hire hackers to break into particular systems for them. So is it an evolving issue? I mean, talk about the hacker, for instance. We think of the WikiLeaker, right? the person who's doing this for the good of openness and transparency, um, and who has a, a, an ideal for that everything should be transparent and things shouldn't be closed. Is that what we're talking about here? I mean, or, is, or is there a thin line that's, that's crossed a lot of times? Well, there are, there are multiple labels for hackers. So mm -hmm. the example that you provided is more of a hacktivist, an individual who um, targets a particular database or uh, gains unauthorized access to a system for some form of political objective. How serious is the threat I mean, that you can see? Well, there, there are many serious threats. We have a scale of different particular illicit activities. We have some of the lower level threats, um, such as spamming, that occur, certain types of website defacements that are jokes, and then we have the more organized attacks, which are quite extensive and, and cause um, extremely high consequences. The Yahoo um, hack, the 500 million people who were affected by Yahoo last in 2014 was astounding, but are there more that we don't even know about? I mean, is that happening every day, basically? It could be, yes. I mean, they're, they're unauthorized, um, individuals gain unauthorized access to particular systems, and if they, if these types of hacks occur um, to private organizations, it is up to them to release this information. Of course, when numerous individuals are targeted within a hack, they do have an obligation to release this information to the public. I mean, the quickly. private company does. Yes. The issue is, though, that many of these private companies are self-regulated, so there aren't any mandatory cybersecurity regulations. Well, how, uh, what I'm trying to get at, I guess, is how widespread it is. I mean, there's a commercial hack, like the Yahoo hack and many other companies that, have, that where information has been breached. And then there's the, the, what we might call the cyber terrorism or cyber sabotage, mm -hmm. where there are perhaps not just criminals, but intelligence agencies, foreign intelligence agencies are involved in it. We've seen that um, suggestion during the last election. Uh, is there a difference in degree, or are they basically using the same techniques? They're using the same tactics. What changes is the consequence, whether it's high impact mm -hmm. or low impact. But 
if it's a cyber terrorist, if it's a hacker, someone who engages in website defacement or any form of illicit actor, they utilize basically the same tactics. They gain unauthorized access to the system. They seek to alter, damage, destroy, or steal information from a particular database. Have you ever been hacked? No. And what would you do if you were? I mean, can you tell that you're hacked? You can. You can check your event logs uh, if you're hacked. And the reality is that my information just like everybody else is stored in third-party databases far removed from my control. So while I have not been hacked, other databases that have held my information and other individuals' information have been hacked, for no fault of my own, of course. And how do you know that? You have to be told. You're notified. Yes, exactly. And once you're told, I've been told several times that, mm -hmm. you know, Yahoo users have been hacked or, you know, such and such company mm -hmm. has been, been breached. What do you do? I mean, it's, you feel really frustrated and helpless because there's not much you can do. There isn't much you can do. And in fact, I, I, I don't think consumers understand how little they are protected in the U.S. Um, there's That's no data protection. It is. You have bits and, piece of data, bits and pieces of data that is protected. Health, financial, educational information, and the vast majority of the rest is up for grabs. And private companies are the ones who are collecting and selling this information. So here's the thing, here's a personal note, because mm -hmm. We're always asked to change our passwords and to yes. make sure that our passwords are as strong mm -hmm. as possible. And I'm beginning to wonder, and I've heard this and read this, that it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can have the strongest password in the world, but somebody is still going to go past your, your firewall. Right. Here's the, the interesting part about security. We always say that we're looking at prevention. You're not really preventing with a password. You're just slowing a perpetrator down. So if the perpetrator will take five years to break into your password, then you can say it's a safe password. But it's not designed to prevent someone holistically. Encryption does the exact same thing. We say that it helps prevent individuals from gaining access to files and data that you have because there's an extended period of time that it would take for them to break into mm -hmm. your particular system, data, or file. So if we're not really fail-safe protected, who can protect us? What can we do? <laughs> well, ideally, we would like to have a particular law in place where users' data is protected, and if companies collect your information, they transfer it, and they sell it, they should be held liable if it is lost. The reality is that this isn't the case today. If data is stolen from a third-party database, what you're offered is something that I like to call security theater. It looks like security, but it really isn't security. So you'll be offered one and a half years of free credit monitoring services, but what you don't understand is that basically just tells you that somebody hacked into your system and that your data was stolen. There's really nothing else there. And the advertisements that show that you're covered up to $1 million, it doesn't mean that if someone took out a $1 million loan, you would get $1 million. Right. So. That's basically what. So you're what's left? Who can, can the government protect us? Are there laws that? I mean, it seems to me we're going in the opposite direction today mm -hmm. because private companies do not want to be liable, or held liable for massive losses of information. Right. The issue is that I don't see a law being passed because of lobbyists. There's no way that a law will be passed if it requires private companies to enhance their cyber their system security at a cost of their own. And in fact, in the U.S., what we promote is self-regulation. We leave it up to companies to determine what level of security uh, they see fit. Um, if we wanted to affect change, what we need to do is involve consumers in this. Because if consumers drive the demand for better protection, we can actually affect some change in this area. Well, the era. problem with that is consumers don't really know what they're asking for. Right. I mean, what are you asking for when you say, I want more protection? Right, because nobody's telling them. And, and that's the, the issue. I think that consumers need to be informed and they need to understand that free services aren't really free services. You're giving data in order to obtain this particular free service. I mean, ideally, if all things in a perfect world, mm -hmm. what would we want government to do? If everybody agreed, well, what kind of laws, if there are such laws, that would make certain bits of information mandatory or make it more, uh, more of a criminal violation to go after them? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you see as a perfect law or a almost perfect law? Well, do you mean against companies who lose information or individuals who steal the information? Well, I guess to protect their systems it's the, themselves. Right. So Mandatory standards, for instance, for, for uh, the kinds of computers you get and when we go on the Internet. In 2013, Executive Order 13636 was passed, which um, tasked the National Institute of Standards and Technology to develop some form of cybersecurity regulations. And in 2014, they passed something known as the Cybersecurity Framework, which actually provided information to both 
public and private institutions on the type of cybersecurity regulations needed to best protect their systems. The problem with this is that it's voluntary. Yes. It's voluntary. It's voluntary. So there can be companies that choose not to implement these particular regulations. What we could do is provide tax incentives to companies as a motivator to implement these cybersecurity standards. But unless there's some form of mandate, I don't, I don't see this enhancement. But specifically, occur. what would we be mandating in a perfect world? Are we mandating certain standards of security for every computer system? Um, for a computer that we get or we go on, a, on the internet, should there be a standard that protects us? Right. So there should be a standard um, for the individuals that actually obtain our information and store it mm -hmm. and transfer it. There should also be a standard for individuals who create software because we, we don't have that either. Uh, companies can, um, can deploy particular software even though it has vulnerabilities and then patch any form of vulnerability once they're made aware of this. The issue is that uh, many of these different uh, software programs, such as Java and Adobe Flash Player, have been known to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? And they put users as ri at risk because you cannot use certain um, websites or certain functions on websites without using those programs, which are inherently faulty. But surely at a, at a certain point, I mean, we'll, we'll reach a level where there's no, just no choice. We'll have to protect ourselves or we just go offline. I mean, 500 million people were affected by the Yahoo break-in. Right. In 2014, millions more uh, were affected by others. Uh, do you see this happening and increasing in in threat and insecurity to all of us? Yes, and I see it happening across all 16 critical infrastructure sectors. So we also have commercial institutions that fall within this. We, we definitely have information and communications technologies, um, and all of our sectors are at risk and at, at some point or another have had their information, their databases breached and information stolen. What do you mean by critical infrastructure sectors? So we have 16 designated infra uh, critical infrastructure sectors that the government views so vital that any damage or destruction to one of these sectors could have a debilitating effect on society. So this is energy, mm -hmm. finance, the healthcare facilities, uh, technology, uh, information technology, communications, water, and the like. So we have 16 of these sectors that we've designated. Um, the reality is that out of these 16 sectors, the vast majority of them are owned by private companies. And we just talked about the fact that cybersecurity regulation is more voluntary for private sectors. Are these, these are particularly vulnerable to cyber terrorism. Of course. How would that happen? So what's interesting is that <coughs> We have labeled certain things as cyber terrorism when we don't really know if they have been cyber mm -hmm. terrorism, right? Because we have that issue of attribution. You really don't know who's or the one motive. With the you money. don't know why they did it, which right. is one. And with terrorists, they'll declare the motive. That's the point, right? They'll target a particular system and they want the media attention to that particular attack. So if some group or some individual has not accepted responsibility, it's more likely not going to be a cyber terrorism incident. Of course, we have had some incidents where states mm -hmm. are believed to have sponsored terrorism. So unless they have a group that's acting on their behalf, this, the state is not going to accept responsibility because attacking a critical infrastructure could amount to an armed attack, which would then justify a country in engaging in some form of um, counter. Think of North Korea as, as the most recent example. Right. And just recently, North Korea has been accused of hiking, of heisting $81 million from a bank in, I think it was in the Middle East, using cyber means. Mm -hmm. So we know that they're doing it. Well, and what's interesting is that we know because we have other information. Uh, as someone who studies, uh, who, who studied digital forensic, worked as a command investigator, I can tell you that the evidence, especially when we're dealing with cyber crime, is circumstantial at best. What we also need is other evidence that can point to and substantiate some of the information we receive. So this could be uh, information obtained through human intelligence mm -hmm. um, or other forms of intelligence sources, or it could be because somebody confesses that we apprehended that was Why do you attack. think, Professor Maris, that we haven't seen a major uh, act of cyber terrorism in the sense that people trying to close down our grid, our electric grid, turn off our water? Why hasn't that happened yet? I mean, surely the capability is there. Um, they may not have be willing to say they did it, but surely it, it could happen now with the technical ability they've got. Mm -hmm. 
it could happen, uh, but I also feel that uh, in, in the U.S., the cyber offensive and cyber defensive capabilities may serve as a deterrent, uh. because if an attack does occur, then a counter attack can be justified, and there is this, uh, it could amount to an act of war. So you were in the military the for seven years, and I know we don't want to have you talk about any military secrets, but are we able to, to um, I don't know if prevent is the word, but intervene when we see uh, an imminent cyber attack? Can we identify one, something that's happening? Well, we have the capabilities to identify cyber threats, um, but there are technologies that, uh, and tactics that criminals are utilizing that are making it more difficult for any professional to locate them. So very much like nuclear war, nuclear defense is also nuclear offense. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets a bit sticky. Cyber defense can also be cyber offense. Mm -hmm. And it's said that we have capabilities of, of being, and that we've used them in being interactive or um, over and proactive in terms of other countries, other systems. Mm -hmm. um, is that a good thing? I mean, should we be able to fight cyber war as well as defend ourselves against it? Well, I mean, this is an interesting, uh, this is most, one of the most interesting aspects of cyber offensive. In order to engage in a cyber offensive, you have to gain unauthorized access to the system mm -hmm. of a different country, which basically means that you've violated state sovereignty by accessing systems if a state is involved. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It, this is a topic of hackback, and um, this is what most countries are discussing in various meetings mm -hmm. as to maybe developing rules on the ways in which to behave sort in of cyberspace. A Geneva Code for cyber warfare. It's, it's, it's necessary. Do you feel confident that we are able at the moment um, as a government to protect yourselves against really serious cyber threats? Yes, but it depends on which systems we're talking about. The, the issue at stake is that public institutions, and especially those tasked with some form of cyber offensive and cyber defensive capabilities, have the necessary know-how to deal with these types of incidents. Our concern is what about all of the other systems that are privately owned that may not have that ability? Because if somebody's trying to, to target communications, that's a private company. Mm -hmm. Right, or if somebody wants to target some form of uh, business, some form of private health institution, which they have with ransomware and other types right. of attacks, they can. This doesn't have anything to do with the Department of Defense. It has to do with these particular... But entities. on the general level, say on the world level, I mean, where do we stand in terms of capability and knowledge and technical expertise? Well, we've... We've actually helped other countries as well. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office um, provides training to different individuals that are responsible for cyber crime investigations, criminal justice agents specifically. We also have a good partners in the United Kingdom, but the reality is the UN published a report a few years ago that showed that there's a general deficit in national capacity to deal with cyber crime, period. In our national capacity. In everybody's national in everybody's. capacity. Because while we have some of the traditional disciplines that are focused on dealing with cybercrime, like computer science, what we're lacking is a social science, science, and humanities application to cybercrime. What we basically need to do is open up the discipline. If we keep it specialized, we're never going to be able to deal with the incidents we're faced with today. So, so that's, prevalent. that's really what your book is about, in a sense, what you're trying to tell students. Talk a little bit about that. How do you meld all those different disciplines in what we hadn't thought of? We thought it was just someone sitting in his, in his, uh, in his bathroom or his bedroom looking at code all the time. And what I try to do is make the discipline um, more approachable to students who, who feel that if they don't know how to computer program, they wouldn't do well in this field. Well, you don't need computer program programming to understand cyber criminals nor cyber victimization online. What you need to know is policies, sociology, economics, political science, criminology, criminal justice, police science, all of those disciplines that are social science in nature. And with science, we need more forensic specialists to be examining computers. Um, and not only the systems, but also what's outside of the system. Do we need more cyber detectives? We do. And cyber detectives mm. don't need computer programming. And, and this book is just to draw attention to the fact that unless we have different disciplines incorporate cyber-related material into their programs, we will never deal See, you know, with so cyber crime. Something that occurs to me, learning, just going back mm -hmm. to the Korean, the North Korean um, example of mm -hmm. 
cyber sabotage or cyber attacks. We, we, we take it for granted that in a developed society like ours, cyber knowledge is widespread and it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And even if you're 12 or 13 years old, you know how to work on a computer. But in a country like North Korea, or perhaps other countries, it's not a given that people have that ability and that background to create this sort of cyber, cyber crime or cyber sabotage. How does someone, how does a country like North Korea develop that capability? When they did nu nuclear weapons, they bought it or bought it from Pakistan. Where does North Korea get it? Where does do other countries get it? Well, I'm assuming using the exact same tactics that they used for, for other types of um, information, know-how, technology. So uh, learning from what other particular countries are doing, ensuring that individuals in key positions are trained. But even then, um, North Korea or other countries will not be able to deal with the, the level of threat that we're faced with today. Um, if, if they have specialized units, which most countries do, which deal with cybercrime and cybersecurity But the issues. science keeps changing, right? I mean, the more, every time you learn a way to protect yourself against one threat, mm -hmm. a new threat appears. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's even more than nuclear weapons or chemical weapons mm -hmm. threat. It keeps expanding and keeps getting more and more sophisticated. How do you possibly keep up with it? Well, I mean, you keep up with it by making sure that you stay current in the field, but there's also something else, too. Some of these large-scale horrific attacks that we're envisioning, uh, someone hacking into a nuclear facility, for example, mm -hmm. those can be simply solved by ensuring that the system itself is standalone. There is this inherent drive to connect industrial control systems, SCADA systems, to other systems that are internet-enabled. That is what puts these systems at risk, and, and that is what we should start uh, preventing. We should make sure that a lot of these facilities, well, mandating that any critical infrastructure does not have these very critical sy systems exposed to external threats. However, that only deals with outsiders. It doesn't deal with the Stuxnet-like threat where someone can come in and mm -hmm. put in a USB drive. Of course, the other side of it is saying that maybe too much of our lives are online. Maybe yes. some of what we should do we should start taking ourselves offline a bit. Is that a reasonable conclusion? It would be difficult to do given the digital footprint we already have for no fault of our own. This is something that private companies have done, unfortunately, on our behalf. Uh, the only way that I can see this fixed is by having a new identifier that is not distributed, that could be used, not the social security number because it's basically been compromised. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have a new identifier, somebody's going to compromise it. At some point. But what we're trying to do is stall. The social security number is, is widely compromised. Think about mm -hmm. the vast majority of databases. They're still um, relying on the monitoring services, even though your social security number is out there. What's a year and a half of a monitoring service going to do for your social security number? Any criminal with common sense is going to wait a year and a half and then <laughs> use your social security number. How, uh, and the students that you have now, mm -hmm. how, how well versed are they? I have a 12-year-old mm -hmm. who knows a lot more about computers than I do. And I'm sure that the younger you get, the more people get, get, mm -hmm. get used to computers and how to deal with them, they feel comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, the, are the, the, the students that you're working with, are they pretty well versed or do they need that extra help that you can give them? So they are well versed, but what I also think has happened is there, there's almost this desensitization to the risks associated with using technology. So while you do have the know-how, um, you still have that, that lack of concern for the amount of data that's already available. So that's, I think, a really important point in the mm -hmm. short time we have left, that a lot of young people are desensitized because they, they feel that nothing they have is private anyway. Mm -hmm. And they shrug and, their shoulders. <laughs> and so they're not going to be worried too much about it. Well, we would, and the older, the older generations, of course, these are mm -hmm. private issues. But mm -hmm. the younger people are saying, nah, we just live with this. Well, and this is why I, uh, in my class, I make sure that they're aware of the risks. And the situation is only going to get worse with the Internet of Things, where everyday objects are connected to the Internet, your coffee maker, your washer and dryer, and all of the objects you have in your home. We're basically creating a surveillance society that any user can hack into one of those devices which aren't as well protected as your computer systems. Thank you, Professor Morris. There's Thank a lot more to say about this. Thanks for coming. Thank you. The Internet has changed our lives, mostly for the better. We can't do without our smartphones or Facebook and Twitter accounts, Snapchat or Instagram. It's a safe bet that as our electronics get even more sophisticated, so will the criminals who try to penetrate our bank accounts and our privacy. The Googles and the Yahoos of this world have a responsibility to protect the information we give them, 
when we use their services. But if they can't or won't, government needs to step in with clear standards. Please don't forget that being smarter about cybercrime still begins with you. But let me know what you think. I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching. See you next time.